barriers and enablers of growing practice change. So what projects have been run in the past or currently, so during the time of this three year project and understanding through a range of mixed methods, how and where change had occurred and what had enabled or in our team's uh, work prevented that change from occurring. So we actually commenced this project um, with a very sort of clear focus on how this needed to actually be looked at and addressed. And at the start of our three year project, our team flew off to Ireland to get training on systems methodologies. And the reason for that is because we came to understand very rapidly that this sector is highly complex. And sugarcane farmers are but one of an industry that is actually co-located against the Great Barrier Reef. It is not alone. There are others, other agribusinesses, and then also other industries who are entirely dependent on the reef. Now this has massive implications because tens of thousands of Australians have an economic and vested interest in the reef. And that can create tensions. And as some of you would be very well aware, it does actually in and of itself, the people can actually with, along with the politics, really impact what's actually happening to support or deny change. So the systems methodology approach was a very big, steep learning curve for me. who was very linearly trained. I'm a business trained marketer by background. I was very used to actually having a problem, finding a solution. But at the same time, I always understood through marketing practice that we as people are heavily influenced, not only by the other people around us, but also the environment. What's available? Can we make something prominent and easy? So if you've ever just picked up a chocolate bar or a packet of chips when you're standing at a checkout somewhere because the marketers have very cleverly put it right in front of you to make it super easy, it's there right at the point that you transact, you actually know that the environment itself has a huge role to play in shaping our own behaviours. What we choose to do, whether we knowingly do it, so with our thinking conscious brain, or whether we're just simply influenced to do it. And so that's some of the larger theoretical underpinnings for the work that we'll be presenting this morning. And I won't belabor that, but it in and of itself does then have a lot to do with the approaches taken to actually make our assessments and arrive pretty much with some very clear findings. So our research aims were threefold. Jim Smart led a team that looked at cost effectiveness. So if data was provided to Jim and his team, they actually got into that data and took one very hard look at the program to understand what the economic payback actually was. Then comes the work of my team. So I led a team of six different researchers across the three years. And our job was to actually understand the reasons why people actually participated in programs or why they didn't. And then importantly, where programs were up, running and there was involvement, what was creating change? So what components of the programs, what supporting factors help facilitate behavioural change? Because as practitioners, I think the clear thing we all want is to understand what works so that we know what we can use, where and when we should actually use it and apply it. So very critical findings that have come through the mixed method work that demonstrate there is progress being made in this field. But as we know through the consensus reports, it's not being made fast enough. We're ending up with chemicals and sediments in the waterways at level that exceed the target set. So there is a lot more work for all of us to do to actually make the change happen faster. And this project has helped find the factors that need to be in place across projects, and then also the factors that need to be minimised to ensure that the support needed is actually there. So I'll start to step you through what is three years of work. And whilst I come in today at a fairly high level, we are more than happy to talk at a much more detailed level across projects, areas, regions, to share what we've learned. So the projects identified at our kickoff meeting that we were tasked as a team to actually run work on are listed here. So across nine different projects implemented either within a small region, so one of the NRMs in Queensland, or across all six. So you can see from the ticks what the aim of our team, you know, our aim set were, and then the crosses denote where we already knew that, a, for example, a cost effectiveness assessment couldn't be run, or for a project like RP20, that a survey simply wasn't relevant because the project was already completed. 
but could we still look at the cost effectiveness of that work? So whilst we were given targets at the start, across three years and many, many meetings, writing proposals and working with stakeholders to attempt to actually get things happening, this is more like what actually occurred. So in and of itself, our project team experienced many of the barriers that we've actually uncovered through the research that we have run. So we have a distinct unwillingness in this sector to share data. We don't trust each other, and that makes it very, very difficult for people to walk in because there is a lack of transparency. And that lack of transparency fosters more distrust. It makes it difficult for the entire sector to move forward. So whilst for us, it probably was a little frustrating at the early days, what we came to realise where there were other ways and so we just pushed forward. And that's where the secondary data comes in because reports are made publicly available, maybe not as many as should be, and that allows further assessments to still be run and undertaken. And in some cases, teams became willing to actually share their data, stakeholders supported that, and again, that allowed our team to make assessments. So our assessments tend to be fairly de-identified. No one needs to be named and blamed. That is not the process that we're trying to use here. Our approach is very reflexive. What can we learn? What works? This is not about making people feel bad. This is about actually documenting, clearly learning from that process and then getting stronger for it. It is very much a process applied across a lot of domains, from commercial to health and everywhere else. So we have to get comfortable with this in order to really progress and get to those very high targets set in terms of the water quality outcomes. The more we have logics, guiding frameworks and clarity that everyone can see, the faster we can progress to get there. So these are learnings that were really critical for our team as we push forward. So across the work, when we look at the factors enabling or preventing practice change, there are major factors or themes that are actually identified. People sit nested inside the institutional settings and the regulations. So when you look at our institutional settings, that's the fact that we have a federal government, a federated structure right across Australia, and then within state, six NRMs. So very clear settings. That's without including the nonprofits, the operators operating within it, both commercial, the actual agribusiness sector itself, and then all of the supporting services. So we all exist within that setting. That setting can be delivering financial support and the market forces themselves are either contributing, so they're helping through good pricing or branding or things like that, or they're actually pulling away. Within that becomes the people themselves, the many, many stakeholders who are at work, not only farmers, but the agribusiness sector, extension service support, chemical resellers, and many, many more. So these stakeholders are out there every day having conversations. And when we come in and evaluate any one singular project, what we always have to remember is that that is just one within a lived experience of a whole year, the many conversations that occur and the multitude of influences that actually happen. So that helps to actually influence farming practices and it then also serves to actually change beliefs. The interactions themselves, can either have clear or unclear communication. And then what we found through past literature, sometimes as we combed backwards, the farm itself, farmer characteristics, also serving to interact and actually these together are enabling or preventing practice change. Now we have dug in at a much higher level than this and I'll share some of that with you today. But a lot of work has actually been undertaken from our team to bring it up to a very high level because this is the high level now that should be actually guiding project governance, monitoring, outcome evaluations. When I talk about outcome, I actually mean the behaviours of the stakeholders in the sector. This needs to critically become the thing that is getting monitored, evaluated, and continually in a process, every project cycle, annually, where we look at the whole intersection to track for change. What's working well, what's supporting, and what is preventing change. So let me step you through some of the activities that our team actually did. So at a glance, we observed, 
We ran social surveys. We also looked at past surveys because we were given access to data. We interviewed people and tracked them over time. So 30 individuals and 27 hours of time tracking people to understand what participation in a program was assisting to do and what could be improved. We ran evidence reviews and there were two different types. The first review was a systemic literature review. By following PRISMA guidelines, running a very clear search term, we extended our focus beyond sugarcane and we actually looked at farming practice change. So anything that was related to sediment runoff and actual chemical application onto farms, to actually look at factors right across projects to understand at a global level what was supporting or denying behaviour change from happening. We then put the microscope harder back onto the projects that we were tasked to look at. This is a grey literature review, and it's different from a systematic literature review in that it goes into Google Scholar, which does have an algorithm and will rank information, and we use the top 100 to come down. So this is where we got specific. Let's search for the project by name, by acronym, and let's see what records are publicly available that anyone can access. Now this is important because if we're sharing our insights and our learning, everyone else can come in and learn from past practice. In our work, I describe this as standing on the shoulder of giants. If we already know things work, then that should be the automatic thing that we do. But when we're trying to push for future change, that also suggests we need to do new things as well. So it doesn't diminish the fact that we still need to learn and grow to get that next step and break that next part pattern that we need to try and get through. We observed people, we ran the cost effectiveness assessments, and then finally we did implement one stakeholder systems approach. And that approach allowed us to actually work with various and diverse stakeholders to challenge why we saw targets continuing to fail to be met. So I'm going to talk you through some of these in turn to just give you a sense of some of the the findings at a high level that have emerged across the bodies of work. Our final report for NEST 4.12 will synthesise all of this and bring it all back together to at least create what we hope is a fairly easy to access uh, summary of our work. So I'm going to start with Jim Smart's cost effectiveness findings. These are under limited circulation because clearly it is sensitive information when you look at costs and investments and it's probably the one thing a lot of us would not be comfortable sharing. But what Jim's work found was that when compared with cost effectiveness benchmarking of other programs, the Reef Reverse Tenders program is extremely effective. And this includes when the costs of administering the program are brought into the cost effectiveness assessment. So one cost effectiveness evaluation that was undertaken that demonstrates this work is actually contributing and actually assisting in a very cost effective way. So a finding that suggests that this can and should be something that is continuing to be supported. And Jim and his team actually listed out a series of questions for where this assessment work could go next. Because there are some key learnings, but at the same time, there are a few more questions that need to be raised and tested. So we do hope to see future work running in that space to continue to drive our understanding forward. The cost effectiveness assessments are a really great way of communicating the value of the work that we actually do. Our evidence review, as I said, did go beyond sugarcane practice change. We feel, felt that globally we have products getting um, grown by growers, we have systems and support structures around them. So what could we learn by taking a wide stance and looking backwards? We restricted our review to five years. We did this because we did believe that people should be learning from the past. So by keeping it to the best of where we were at at the moment in time that we commenced the review, that last five years should have given us the best practice contemporary understandings. So through a huge process of sifting through 5,044 records, so these are journal, double-blind, peer-reviewed papers reported scientifically, that reported something that would have been about farming practices and change. What we did find within that large stack are very few that report behaviour change outcome evaluations. So that dropped that very wide stack right down to 75 clear studies to actually look at. To get to that 75, there was a clear process followed, which was the PRISMA guidelines. 
So a very rigorous process that can actually be followed by other research teams and similar outcomes should therefore be arrived at. Now this is the evidence review that led to the main themes that we've actually worked within. And the rest of our work now is getting synthesized back into these issues. And what you can see here are both the theme, how we defined it to make it very clear about what a factor specifically was, and then whether there's barriers or enablers. Now we haven't repeated enablers across into barriers. Too much information. But imagine this world where if an improved financial return enables a practice change, then similarly, a poorer financial return will actually prevent that from happening. So you need to look at every single enabling factor as something that should be there underpinning a project, but understand also the very absence of it could actually prevent behavior change from happening. So the more we have the enablers in place, well supported and happening, the better off we actually are. So this is our primary focus. And this almost serves as a checklist. We have it up on the wall and is all of this happening across the sector? So for those that are actually in the higher governance roles, these are becoming very high level things that need to be tracked, monitored and considered. When we're actually on ground, so a stakeholder, for example, in extension services, who's supporting practice change, we have a different level of work that we're controlling and looking after. And then within this, there's a lot of detail that goes beyond this. But our own business management practices, how much we communicate what other people are actually doing, this is called social norms. These are the things that should automatically become part of everyday practice. Because the more we're doing it well, the better off the change starts to get. So when we look across to the barriers, these are issues that if they exist, can actually also prevent change from happening. So a strong industry influence that's actively promoting additional application of chemicals runs against any effort to reduce chemical reduction. So it is something that needs to be monitored, and understood, measured, tracked, and looked at. We need to understand that the, our failure to deliver clear communication, our failure to understand what it is that people actually need and want, is preventing practice change from happening. So it's all well and good that we think we're getting a message across, but if we're not delivering a message well, it's not liked, it's not received, then it still has no effect. So we have to get better as a sector at making sure we are communicating, and then when we're communicating, the message is clear. Now across bodies of work, and this is not just from this systematic literature review, it is very clear that there is mixed signals being sent. And that makes sense. Different stakeholders might be saying something in a different way that then starts to serve to confuse. So it does make it a little bit difficult for all of us to work together to actually create the change that we want to see. Now, the, <coughs> excuse me, the final thing I want to draw your attention to is that in the literature base, the science base, there is a heavy emphasis on individuals. The farmer, the farm's characteristics, and then also their beliefs, attitudes, individual capabilities. A lot of emphasis has been placed in research on what people think, what they know, whether they're motivated, they care about the environment, their own beliefs about practices, their experience with the practices and what they expect as an outcome. People have also looked extensively at trust, the lack of trust between parties, but a lot of emphasis has been placed on growers' resistance to change. So what this has done is upped the microscope on a farmer. It does create reactants in community. It makes some people feel bad. And when you consider there are multiple stakeholders, so go back to the fact that tens of thousands of people are dependent on both agribusiness and then also other industries around the reef. That does create a lot of tension. So we found it very interesting that so much of the emphasis was on people themselves, the people targeted for change, and less on the sector that it's actually entrusted with and given custodianship and responsibility to facilitate that change. Our work stretched forward. We ran the grade literature review. So this is where we specifically looked at the projects we've been tasked with measuring 
and monitoring. So what, in, what information was publicly available that would come up easily through a Google, Scholar, a Google search? And Google as a search engine was chosen because it is a main search engine. A lot of literature out there showing that those of us that jump online are highly likely to jump into Google and search for something. So for example, if I'm curious about one of the projects, Project Catalyst, I might go online and literally enter it and start to look for what evidence I can find about that program to demonstrate that it works. So we did a search uncovering 872 results. So again, a lot of reported work out there in relation to these projects. But when you put these pieces under the microscope of what actual change is reported and clearly reported, the outcome starts to really again drop right down into the microscope and we're left with 21 records that clearly report outcomes from sugar practice change projects. So when I talk about outcomes, this might be reductions in application of fertilizer or chemicals, changed farming practices that prevent sediments from getting off farm. These are the outcomes. What are the behaviours that have changed that might then lead to the water quality outcomes? So that work allowed us to uncover the 21 records and then we combed through those reports, those case studies, the papers, whatever it might have been, to actually see, once again, which factors were actually clearly reported. So across this work, things that enabled practice change are strong and good partnerships. Partnerships that exist between government and industry. Effective, so this is clear, well understood communication. Good training and education. So this is the type of training that people actually value. Something that they enjoy coming to, they get value from and report that they would do again. Community led initiatives are definitely a facilitating factor. So when we say community led, these are the projects that actually involve growers from even project inception right through to reporting outcomes. The more grower involvement there is, the better practice change can actually be facilitated. Financial support is raised as a factor that can actually enable change. And interestingly, when we look at financial support, there's a lot of debate around this issue about whether we create a dependence model. So if we're directly incentivizing, does that assist to create lasting change? And more research is going to be needed there to understand and disentangle that. In marketing, I was clearly trained to not compete on price. A price is a very easy thing to move. It's a very easy thing to copy. But unfortunately, when I take my price promotion away, I'm back to where I originally was. So it always was something in my training to use as a last resort or an end one, not the first and foremost thing we should actually do. So has the core offering that we've built delivered the return on investment that farmers would value? Because putting chemicals onto a farm is actually a huge input cost. So it shouldn't be difficult to get people to put less on farm if better production outcomes can still be realised. So how well is that actually demonstrated in science and how well is that still understood in community? because it is a no-brainer if it's happening really well. Social factors are a significant barrier. So the way people serve to interact, a lack of support, or services delivered that aren't valued, do actually prevent change from kicking in. The Gray Evidence Review also identified the lack of alternatives. So there are some chemicals out there that are considered key to a, a prop being realised. And across a five year cycle, you don't want to run the risk of losing a year of five years of income on a certain crop on the basis of just not putting one chemical on and having a grub come through and wipe out that crop. So in the absence of true alternatives, it is very difficult to actually get people to change their behaviours. The more research and development work that can be run to either realise new crops that are resistant to something or have it a replacement something to actually help monitor the pest would actually be highly useful in this case. I said at the start, a lack of trust between stakeholders in this sector is a significant barrier to change. People do not want to share information. People are not clear and transparent 
and this is preventing a lot of change from actually happening. So competing interests, competition between players, the funding models themselves could actually be interrogated very hard and well to actually further support more change. And then finally, there's the research and the dissemination. Are we saying it clear enough as a research community? And are we fast enough at taking a measurement and then showing the results and the outcome? Because a six month lag between when something's monitored and then coming back to report, and they can be longer than that, a year, 18 months, it's too long for people to remember what specifically happened at that point in time. So the faster the research community can be, at getting real dashboards up that people can see fast and straight away, the better we would get at helping people to really start to make the connections that we all need to see. So speed kind of matters. Our interviews, as we said, actually involved 30 people. These were people inside and outside of various practice change projects. And we monitored them over time. So people were kind enough to let our team back three years running to have conversations around what supported them and what also did not help to get practice change. So a lot of learnings from this work. This was a, a systems piece. So we had a framework, Mechanisms, Action and Structure it's called, or MAS for short. So what is it that happens for farmers who are participating to reflect and actually look at what they actually do? So mechanisms themselves are the very direct things that kick in. They're the things about the people. So you can see here, for example, barriers are some people are risk averse. They don't want to have something go wrong with their crop. And again, it's a huge income hit if you lose your crop. Sometimes financial restrictions prevent people from kicking in hard and fast to make change. They can see it, they know they need to, but they don't have easy access. So going back to the earlier evidence reviews, there could be a role for finance across this to assist in the sector. Things that do actually prevent change are the fact that scorecards happen at a whole of region level. Now, if your farm is actually onto a localised waterway, and that's the waterway that's getting scored, it's getting a whole lot easier to understand your own impact as a farmer within your region where you can sometimes actually see what your neighbours do. This is something we could be doing in the sector to actually help go further. So there's a lot of findings from the interview work that demonstrate right from the individual level, some of the things that might be preventing or enabling them to change, but then also the stakeholder actions and interactions as well. So things that we could see through the interview work were that learning from each other firsthand really matters. And this is where the sector has a huge role to play. The projects that are implemented, put out there to test, trial, learn and get better and stronger, do have a huge supporting role to play in practice change. So the more we can do them, the more we can actually communicate them wisely and well, the better off all of our people actually are. We need more people outside of projects to hear about these projects. And sometimes there's a huge unwillingness to talk. It's almost a fear. And that's an issue. It needs to be addressed and it needs to come out stronger and harder. We need to be prepared to talk about this and to have it out there very clearly. Not everyone likes everything. And the more we can manage to get the most people there on board and listening, the better off we'll actually become. Because in this sector, there still remains a huge distrust in guidelines. Some people simply don't believe that we've got the right things in place. And yet we have a huge amount of data out there. But that data isn't necessarily shared, nor is it clearly understood. So a lot more work here still needs to be done because there is so much work that's so great that needs to come forward. We also observed practice change happens every day. Now, it happens through a variety of different means, including industry itself, out there at work, trying to understand how they can do things better, because ultimately, they're there for a reason, to be custodians of their land, to make cash, to look after their own families and have a future. So understanding a little bit more about what works, what attracts people and how they actually do it, is a fabulous way of getting insights into what is supporting and preventing practice change. So observational studies were undertaken by our team, 100, more than 100 hours, 
More than 150 people observed across an array of different meeting types. So pictured here is a field day. But this is not all. Shed meetings, the localised one-to-one -one interactions and more were all part of the observational study. Trying to get an understanding, again from a system standpoint, about what might be facilitating or preventing change. What was actually identified in the observation study that is a really key one that I've just almost spoken to already was the lack of preparedness to share findings on projects. It should just be happening automatically if it's a part of a funded study, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Some staff were unwilling to walk in and just make it the first headline piece of information. And this needs to happen. And the communication itself needs to be timely. If things are getting monitored and measured, then the results must come out quickly and they must be disseminated super quickly. The more support there is to achieve that, the better the outcomes will actually be. As more people start to change their own conversation around a specific issue. So if it's about understanding what arrives into a waterway, being involved in a project changes how people start to actually think. The more people can see the outcome, the quicker they understand what else needs to happen. And no one wants to see something in the waterway because that's the equivalent of dollars draining through the dirt into water. So there is a lot we can do to prevent that from happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. So finally, across the systems work, we actually ran what we call the creating collective solution process. It's pictured here. This is a stakeholder process. Let's get diverse people who aren't normally having conversations together. Let's understand one issue from all of the different standpoints and then start to figure out, based on the one question, what we're going to set as priorities and then look for solutions to do it. And this is why we call it CCS, because it is very solutions focused. How can we move forward? So pictured here is the CCS process used in Mackay. First, the working group is formed, and this involves people from very different backgrounds coming together. So including policy makers, people inside a project, but also people who are not inside that project. So we need the outsider in view for this process to be realised at its very best. That group gets together and it, guided by a team with a lot of design thinking principles in place, a challenge to actually identify the range of stakeholders that should be considered and invited into a conversation. So if you're having a conversation about chemicals in waterways, then you want the industry involved who are selling chemicals inside this conversation, as well as the environmental movement, all of the projects and the people that are trying to also then prevent those chemicals from landing up in the waterway after being used in agribusiness. They go forward and a trigger question guides the rest of this process. It generates either priorities or barriers. And again, the workshop comes together to not only sort, but actually work through for solutions. So I'll just step you through what that actually looks like. Within our work, the um, project working group identified the trigger question. It was a two hour process, and in fact, multiple meetings ahead of this working group to get to a finely tuned worded question that everyone understood would get the same outcome that we were actually looking for. The trigger question was, what is preventing farmers from permanently reducing pesticide losses in the Sandy Creek catchment? You can see pictured in speech bubbles, some of the barriers that were actually identified. We had more than 63 stakeholders who identified 219 different barriers and within the workshop, 15 different organisations represented. So this is the workshop at the end of the process. Some of the barriers look like this and different stakeholders had remarkably different viewpoints. So some people actually telling us lack of alternatives, a lack of knowledge of the product, a lack of knowledge about incorrectly calibrating setup equipment and so on. What you can see in the bubbles on the side is the consensus process in the early stages. So people being challenged to start to think about which ones they felt were most important. But importantly, people were challenged to take on everyone's viewpoints. And that becomes interesting because from an individual's point of view, you start to see how other people respond to that same question 
that you yourself have responded to. So being in the room and present in person, people could either directly see their own answers or admit they couldn't remember what they actually said at the time. No data was removed. The only instance of a data point here being taken out was if two different individuals had written the exact same barrier. So for example, two people might have written lack of alternatives and that was just combined into one. We only had three instances of that in this project. So all barriers brought forward for all people to actually see. So other issues that people identified that were preventing like the chemical cutback, failure to change, refusal to change, believing their own farming practices are good, lack of belief that pesticides cause environmental harm. So a lot of people pointing fingers straight to a farmer. Others acknowledging that application of pesticides is difficult. Rain is unpredictable. So if you don't get your forecasting right, runoff will occur. The fact that some people work off farm and that that makes actual application timing more difficult. For others, it is easy. They're on farm all the time and can actually be there. Other time constraints. So what is someone's capacity to be running things at particular times? The challenge of connection, more connections between all of us were definitely a huge issue identified. So for example, information hasn't been shown in the water quality results. A lack of chemical research by the manufacturers, e.g. Bayer. Distrust in scientific advice. How do these scientists really know that reduced applications on my farm will actually work? So a lot of different points of view coming through. So the CCS workshop itself, was actually brought together by the project working group. It was a five hour process that brought 20 people from seven different stakeholder groups together. These stakeholder groups are pictured here. Cane growers themselves, chemical resellers, government, the extension support and agronomy industry, and contractors along with NRMs. So bringing together very different people who are all focused and working into a similar issue. The voting process went through multiple rounds and each person in the first round was asked to take 219 barriers and reduce them down to 36. And you can see here pictured some of the workshop participants placing their first four stickers for each area onto the issue that stood out for them. If you look across the room, you can see the 219 issues all up on the board. Everyone could read everything. They're holding their little individual summary sheets so they had the opportunity to read all of this before they came in to participate in this first stage. So a lot of thought that went on, a very quiet stage as people familiarise themselves with a lot of information and it in and of itself is a bit of a process as you start. But this is the point where everyone really starts to see very wide and different viewpoints together. From that process we got them to start to do the reduction. So we needed to get from 36 down to 12. And so we did this using two different rounds of dots. So blue, where they could put just one across each section, and they had a bonus vote. Because as marketers, we're big believers, free choice really matters. So if you felt so passionately about a specific barrier, you could put as many as five stickers against that particular barrier on your own to actually try and get it through the, the rank order list. So it gave people some freedom. But here you can see with people standing in the room looking, there's still a bit of spread across all the issues, but in some cases a real strong contender starts to jump through. We have since also run that process online and I can tell you it doesn't change order or structure or anything else um, along the way. Because we did wonder at the time in the room, are we somehow influence, influencing each other? Running it online, we can see that's not the case at all. It's still ultimately, created a lot of different viewpoints coming through. After we get through that process and we're down to the main points, we use mapping software. And this software requires people to go through multiple rounds. So we've got those 12 key issues and we're trying to sort out now what's going to make it easier to start to address all of this problem. So 46 rounds were run. People had to vote. Does barrier A 
worsen barrier B. So pictured here on screen, does a lack of product knowledge worsen people's lack of confidence to monitor and evaluate effectiveness of the action? And people had to either agree or disagree. So a show of hands, the hands went up if everyone agreed, and they had to reach 70% consensus. So if we didn't have enough hands up in the room, we had to get people to stop, have a conversation, and then we invited them to vote again. So there were a couple of contentious ones that had to be discussed twice before they got passed to get a final consensus point. But those first few points made the rest of it start to get a whole lot easier as people shared their viewpoints. They discussed, they debated, and then they started to step forward. So that, what, that process of 46 rounds of voting gets us to this structural map. If we address the one over here on the left side on my screen, it makes doing everything else easier. And what the sector identified in this workshop was that a lack of knowledge of the product did have a very strong influence across the rest of the issues. If we can fix that, we're going to increase confidence to monitor, we're going to reduce resistance to change, and we're going to overcome uncertainty. So a very clear pointer here that could we do a little bit more, including have some industry strong leadership to start to actually push for change. Now there was also here one other factor and that was runoff, like stormwater runoff pits. And it was literally a box. When you see the reports, it sits there in the bottom corner all by itself. As a clear structural thing that could happen on farms, none of the human factors here influence it, nor did it influence them. So it kind of sat there as the little lonely factor that also can actually assist and be put, bought in to help actually achieve the drop in pesticide runoff. So once people got the map, that map was used as a focal area to start moving forward. And here you can see a design thinking task. We invited people from the point where we'd spent a lot of the morning focus right across all of the barriers, starting to prioritise them to get to that map, to actually move forward to say, what are we actually going to do about it? Before we moved them into a full co-design process, we just got each individual to actually write down two ideas themselves. And pictured here, you can see the design thinking and participatory design approaches at play. Can we now get each other to show each other our ideas and start to steal the ideas that we think are really good ones? So again, it's just socialising some of that thinking about what can we actually do about it? So we challenged the teams to come about this in two different ways. The first one was recognising that just sometimes it's not more money that needs to be thrown at something. So we asked a question, without any further budget, with no change in your human resources, what could you do by next week in response to that action map? And this is what the stakeholders themselves in the workshop came up with. As extension or agronomy support services, we could survey growers about the outcomes from this workshop and see what they agree with. We need to work with them to understand what they actually want. We could actually have two sentences summarising the great work we've done and get that up and out and onto social media. There's lack of communication, lack of talking to each other was a key issue. We could actually get the science papers and break it down and make it easy for people to actually understand. And that tells us for the research community, this is something we can and should be doing so much more of, bringing it all forward. We then got teams to work together for a period of time. So gave them quite a, quite a patch of time with that, all of that thinking work they'd been doing all morning to say, what is it that we can now do in the longer term? This was where we invited them that maybe funding and human resources now needs to be considered. Over time, are there approaches that can and should be done? Pictured here, you can see one team who actually drew us a stream, had a beautiful analogy and explained their solution back to the wider group. Each team had to do this. They pitch and tell us what their solution actually looks like. So here's an example. We need grower-led initiatives. Grower to growers could be a way to do it. If we meet every Thursday and get five to six people, start to talk and have peer-to-peer -peer and growers leading the conversation, understanding the data, 
we might actually help facilitate more change. We can actually get more knowledge and increase people's knowledge, ensuring that this is delivered by reliable, trusted sources. So when you look at the words stated so clearly, we need an army of trained, trustworthy, available agronomic advisors who are able to offer service and support that people need. And this support and advice needs to be consistent. So less individuals spreading different types of messages and more individuals who really do earn and have and hold trust. We can get more customised one-on-one -on -one support and help actually move some people further forward because there are different types of support that different types of people need. And this was highly recognised by the group and more training across the sector could and can happen to actually assist that. And then finally, continuing to move communication to become far more positive. So what are the great case studies? Where are the, where are the outcomes being achieved? Making sure more people know about it and getting it out there far more often than it still continues to happen today. So our work is just about getting wrapped up and coming to an end. And as at yesterday, I was sitting there counting individual, even those 219 barriers, to understand how often they appear across the different studies, to essentially hand back out to the sector a nice rank order list. That list is supported where something appears the most across most studies. We would be pointing and suggesting that is now a factor you should be actively pursuing and managing for. So guided by our systems thinking, and that we do have a shared responsibility here, our work has sought to understand what is actually contributing to or preventing practice change. So I hand back to the room. I thank you for coming in this morning and do, does anyone have some questions? Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I will go to the chat and just um, have a look at the, the, the chat to see what we have here. And it looks like we've got a comment from Mari Vitelli that she's made, um, probably just inquiring as to some of your sources, but she's also inquired about um, whether or not you did a search, Sharon, um, on the Rural Extension and Innovation Systems Journal, um, just looking at a, a, a range of Australasian articles on practice adoption, extension and evaluation. Um, is that yeah. something that you considered? Marie, to answer the question very directly, the Google Scholar search actually started with the actual project name. So we didn't go into a journal specifically. We actually looked from Google, imagining that I am not a researcher or someone with access to specific journals and that I am just literally looking up that project for the first time. So any evidence review and the search process we use will actually dictate the findings of what actually comes in or out. Within that paper, we do point to the 21 records themselves so that people can clearly see what gets swept up within that initial 100 record list and then what actually gets through to arrive at the final outcome. So as that work gets interrogated, people will pick up any other last issues or errors. But the reality is there are different ways we could run that search. So we could actually have a specific review that actually goes in and chooses certain journals that we know the sector selects, such as you're actually recommending here, and then have up to, you know, for example, 10 different ones and localise that and then search backwards. Um, we believe a lot more work across this space should happen. Ours was restricted to those nine projects. We do also believe if it were already wider across all efforts and initiatives, um, that would help uncover potentially more factors, but at the same time, it may just deliver now more evidence to back up the factors already located. So it's a great question. Thank you.